Well, uh, there are so many places that Monsignor Michael referenced there uh, that resonate with our experience at Aid to the Church in Need. And uh, among them, uh, perhaps the most, uh, the one that made biggest impression on me that he referenced was uh, the Our Lady of Salvation Church or Cathedral in, in Baghdad. Uh, this was a church that I was in only a year ago uh, working with aid to the church in need, uh, we were able to go to Baghdad and see that work that's been carried out since that terrible atrocity, 31st of October 2010. I remember it only too well. I was standing in Lloyd's Bank, looked up on the screen, and the news broadcast the, the bombing. And there I was some years later in the church, after which time aid to the church in need had worked to repair the church, had worked to support those unable to come to church in different ways. And now that church is functioning again, much smaller community, but only possible through the charity, through the compassion and the love of our benefactors at Aid to the Church. And I really wanted to begin my part of this session uh, to thank all those of you who I know are great supporters of Aid to the Church in Need because your work is working miracles. We, you will know the strap line, they are tested in faith, we are tested in love, which is uh, a theme of aid to the church need. It remains true now as ever. My job with aid to the church in need, of course, is to go and witness to the reality of persecution where it is going on. And I thought that I'd spend just a few minutes sharing with you some of the stories, some of the individuals who I've met, because we can look at statistics, we can look at evaluations, but they just do not have the same impact that actually the encounter, the personal encounter has. And so I'm going to begin by uh, metaphorically speaking, of course, taking us to, to Syria. And of course, we're back in Syria because yesterday we were able to announce a huge aid package uh, for the earthquake victims, 500,000 euros has been, um, is our target to provide emergency aid uh, to those who are suffering at this time. And we've just launched that appeal and a huge response to that. But that is built on the legacy of uh, the work that we were doing at the height of ISIS, the period of ISIS-Daesh control. And it was at that point, uh, just after the li so-called liberation of Aleppo, uh, that I went with our intrepid Middle East Projects coordinator uh, uh, Father Andre Halemba, we travelled into Aleppo, and it really was something to behold. And uh, we had uh, scenes in the east of Aleppo that were rather like what you see on the screen right now. And we have the most amazing project coordinator out there, uh, a local project partner called Sister Annie Demargian, who meant, some of you I think have met, because she's come over here a number of times, and Sister Annie said, look, come with me. Come with me and I'll introduce you to some of the people that you, through your generosity, through your generosity rather, are, are supporting. And she introduced me to a number of people, but the person that made most impact to me was a man named Antoine. Now, Antoine told me his story, which was translated for me by Sister Annie. He went to work one morning and found that his place of work, factory, had been converted into uh, a center for Daesh. Daesh had taken over it, and when they saw Antoine enter, they grabbed him, so he told me, by the, by the scruff of the neck. They put a, a knife to his throat and a gun to his head, and they told him to convert. Well, he is a canny man, Antoine. He played for time. And during 78 days, he was held hostage whilst they pressured him uh, to convert. And they then got fed up with him, and they said to him, we have a mission for you. And your mission is to uh, put on a suicide jacket tomorrow morning, first thing, head out of here and travel to Western Aleppo, where you are to detonate the, the, the explosive. Well, that night, so he told me, he could barely sleep, as you could well imagine. And he then um, woke 
or became vaguely conscious, and he sensed a tap on his shoulder. He later said it was Our Lady telling him to get up and go, make his escape. Well, this seemed impossible. The place was swarming with Daesh people, but he nonetheless tried the door of where he was being held, his effectively his cell, and he then found it open. It just, the door released. He went out into the main hall, and it turned out that all the Daesh people were at prayer, the first prayers of the day. And so he went to the main entrance, which had a chain round it, and he, he tried this door, and it somehow the chain uh, gave way, and he was able to make his way out. And he was able then to return to Western Aleppo, get shot of his suicide vest, and that very evening he was reunited with his family. And Sister Annie, telling the story, said, we are at aid to the church need, with your help, able to provide them with new accommodation, medicine for Antoine as he begins to make his recovery from this terrible experience. And he then said, well, you know, we're running very low on money to pay the rent. And I had brought some money with me, and I handed it to um, his wife, Georgette, pictured there on your screen. And uh, she said, as she passed the money to him, uh, didn't I tell you the Lord would never abandon us? And I think this particular uh, narrative speaks volumes about the way in which the universal church, we as Catholics, as Christians, people of faith, are united at such a very vital level in a life-giving way that enables each of us to draw from each other a new strength, a new energy, a new commitment uh, to our faith and to one another. And this is made possible through your kindness. And it also gives us, teaches us lessons of courage, appropriate levels of courage uh, and generosity of spirit and of patience in times of adversity. Very quickly, I'll tell you one or two other stories. One involves Bishop John Han Dingxian of um, Hebei province, uh, south of Beijing in China, who I met. Uh, I never got to meet him myself, but our project partners uh, out there and project coordinators knew him well. For 35 years, this particular bishop of the underground church in China suffered grievously under house arrest, in prison camps, They're trying to drum into him uh, uh, an end to his Christian beliefs, and yet he refused. And at the very end of his life, he p was able to produce some little videos. And he had arranged with one of his secret congregants or parishioners who remained in the shrubbery down below, outside where he was being detained under house arrest. And this camera was shone, or, or was directed rather, up to his balcony. And the balcony, as you can see from the image, was caged. And the bishop would come out look hesitantly around, and seeing that the coast was clear, would unfurl a banner of Christian slogans, and then poke through the bars across a crucifix to show the triumph of the cross in times of adversity. When I went to China in 2007, this bishop had just died. We were not allowed to go to his place of burial. Only two or three people at a time were allowed to go there. And his heroism, his strength, of faith, his courage, is something that continues to, sh to, to drive us to shape our response as we respond to the suffering church in its different manifestations. And the final story involves Michelle, who I met in Khartoum. She was being displaced there, and the Christians at that time in 2004 were suffering hugely, and uh, they were denied access to basic provisions. We at aid the church need were providing support through a scheme called Save the Savable Food, Schooling, and other things. And Michelle realized that this situation of remaining too true to her Christian faith was costing her hugely in terms of quality of life, of standard of living. And holding up her beaker of water uh, to me, she said, I would rather uh, just simply live on this beaker of water and other such basic provisions than to live a lie and deny my faith. So these are the stories that we at Aid to the Church in Need have the great privilege of telling. But we can't really help them as a community 
unless we know their story. And this is what we are dedicated to doing. In 2006, we at Age of the Church Need UK established what we call Persecuted and Forgotten, a report on Christians oppressed for their faith. And we produced the most recent edition only last November, in time for Red Wednesday, which I know a lot of you get behind. And it provides a summary of where persecution is happening, how severe it is, uh, and uh, what are the main drivers, what are the main causes. And as you can see there, the situation shows no sign of improving. It shows every sign of getting worse. And one of the findings I want to quickly draw out is the one for Africa. We looked at six countries in Africa, and uh, in each of these countries, the situation showed a manifest decline, most particularly in Nigeria. And I'm going to focus on Nigeria just for a moment and say that on the 5th of June, 2022, a Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, no less, um, parishioners packed into St. Francis Xavier Church in Owo, and there, as mass came to an end, shots rang out, explosives were thrown, and within a killing spree that lasted the best part of 25 to minutes to half an hour, uh, 41 people lay dead, 70 plus injured. And we at Aid to the Church in were very blessed to have the visit of Bishop Arogondade, Bishop Jude Arogondade, who came. He came to, t to the UK, he launched our Persecuted and Forgotten Report, and one of the things he asked us to do was not only to repair the church that was damaged through these explosions, also to provide counseling, support for uh, those injured with long-term injuries, but also to seek some level of justice. Because seven, eight months on, no one, to our best of our knowledge, has been charged in connection with this atrocity. In spite of it taking place in broad daylight, in spite of it being uh, something uh, that, that really everybody was able to witness. And the bishop was calling on aid to the church in need to help him to put pressure on the UK government to in turn lobby, to challenge the Nigerian government to do more to bring these people to justice. And he specifically did so telling the stories of the survivors. And I was able to meet one of the survivors uh, virtually, uh, and her name is Margaret Attar. Margaret Attar, mother of four, no ophthalmologist nurse, uh, lost two legs, both legs, and lost the sight in one eye. And yet, when I spoke to her, she said, I've only one thing to say to you, and that is words of gratitude. Gratitude to God that I'm still alive, gratitude to God that I still have a chance to live out my life. And yet, she also demanded justice, and that's why we at Aid to the Church in Need uh, are calling on a petition, calling for uh, your support for our petition. There it is, our petition um, in support of Bishop Jude's call uh, for justice for Margaret, for the 70 plus others who were injured, and for the families of those who lost loved ones. So uh, we invite you today to uh, join our petition. You can see the QR code if you want to take a photo of that and go on to the place where on our website where you can register your own uh, support. Please do. Or come and find our, our stand, our stall, and add your, your own voice uh, to, to our call for uh, uh, justice for Margaret, for Bishop Jude, and for many, many others. Because as Bishop Oh, sorry, I still think of him as Bishop <laughs> because I've known him most of the time as Bishop Michael. Monsignor Michael said we need to target the support and we need as well a level of advocacy. That is part of what we can give them, the suffering church. So, and the final thing to say um, is, of course, all this is in the context of Red Wednesday. Red Wednesday has been a remarkable thing and I must pay tribute to Patricia Hatton, my colleague, who was the, uh, really the leading light in the, in the emergence of Red Wednesday, um, shining a light on persecution, seeing Red calling for an end to this terrible injustice and standing shoulder to shoulder with our fellow Catholics, our fellow Christians, and indeed all those whose uh, simple act of, of being a person of faith lands them in deep hot water. So please come and see our stall, please support us, and as 
uh, Monsignor Michael rightly says, always remember the power of prayer. Uh, this is such a critical part. So that's, that's what I have to say. We're now, uh, we, we now got a best part of 15 minutes for, for questions. And I'm going to kick off uh, with a question myself. If you like to, to think of questions, whilst I'm posing one question to Monsignor Michael, um, please, this is your chance to have a think of a question. We have um, two people who've got at least one roving mic. Um, so, meantime, I'm just going to take a, a, a seat and ask Monsignor Michael uh, the, the, a question. So, um, a first question for Monsignor Michael is, do you think, as someone who writes in the Telegraph, who's often quoted in other publications, uh, and who indeed has been a great support to aid the church in need in helping us gain uh, coverage in uh, the national media, do you think our media give due attention to this subject of persecution, uh, of particularly of Christians, and do you, do you see it getting worse, or do you think it's getting better? What, what would you suggest? Yeah, I think there is an embarrassment about this. Uh, it has to be said in the mainstream media. You can get something in edge ways, as you say, I, I do sometimes. I mean, uh, Boxing Day was asked by the Telegraph, you know, would you like to write something on the persecution of Christians? But that's probably because it was Boxing Day, you know, and um, the politicians were all on holiday. Um, th there is an embarrassment, I think partly because so many in the mainstream media have for various reasons, turned away uh, from a Christian faith and a Christian worldview. And so they're then embarrassed to find that, Christ, you know, the church is, is not the sort of the oppressor mm. uh, and the denier of freedom. And so it's actually the church is suffering for these reasons. So that's, uh, that is one reason. Uh, they also, I think, mistakenly think that other people of other faiths will resent the Christian story being told. I, I don't think this is true, but it is often used uh, as an excuse. There are opportunities, um, and sometimes um, a question that is not ostensibly about the persecution of Christians can then be answered. Um, so um, on the question of the situation in Iran, for instance, um, one feature of Iran, which is not often mentioned, is the persecution of people of different faiths. Mm. And while I've been uh, concerned to support Christians in Iran, I also know that the Baha'is, for instance, have suffered even more, if that's possible, than the Christians. So it is possible to say these things in the context of a general question about the, re about the region or the political situation. You can, you can bring it in sometimes, you can be asked, but we have to be alert about um, opportunity. I mean, you mentioned Red Wednesday. It's now known, but I was asked by a major newspaper when you first had Red Wednesday, you know, what is this? And could you write something about it? So you, you, you helped me to write something about it. And, we can create these opportunities. Mm, fantastic. And a, a final question would be, um, what can Christian persecution, especially in places such as, as occasionally happens in your native Pakistan, but also in the other countries that you yourself have touched on, yeah. in Burma and Iraq and others, um, what can that teach us here in the West about how to stand up for our faith, how to articulate our faith against a background of what you might call increasing hostility or suspicion, cynicism, or indeed, in some instances, persecution. What would you think in relation yeah, to that? Yeah, I mean, a number of things. I think the first is, in my experience, uh, persecution elsewhere usually starts with discrimination and exclusion. So if we find that is happening here, which I think is the case, I mean, Ryan will talk about that more in a moment, that there is discrimination uh, in terms of public appointments or certain kinds of jobs or 
or whatever. But that, you know, that's a danger sign. Mm -hmm. If there's exclusion, that's a danger sign. So we can learn from those situations. But of course, the main thing is uh, the wit. I mean, martyr means witness, mm. and we can learn from the persecuted church how to witness clearly to our faith when we are under pressure, uh, because that is when it counts. Uh, in in the in the divine scheme of things, persecution has a place in the economy of God, and I think that place is to. Um, help the church, particularly in the West, to learn how to witness fearlessly. Hmm. Well, thank you very much, Monsignor Michael. How to witness fearlessly. That's... So that, that's, I think, a very good end point to that stage in our discussion this afternoon, how to witness fearlessly. And um, with that, does anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, there's a, a person in the front. We'll take two or three at the same time. I think two. Two, two yes. Let's <laughs> that's, that's okay. try two questions if there are two. Hi, I'm Catherine. I'm from the Sadek uh, Diocese. My question is that recent with uh, India, I'm quite uh, upset to see what's happening there mm. because first the Muslims were persecuted, now the Christians. Yeah. Is it only the Catholic community or is it Christians in, as a whole? Yeah. And what can we, or maybe you are doing it at the moment, are you all meeting with the heads of the country to see if they can help and see what the reason is? Because, mm. may, excuse my thinking, is that maybe they've got an agenda for it. Mm. So maybe with that, Maybe they can help to kind of ease the persecution of Christians. Mm -hmm. And also, it's happening in Holy Land of recent. So, it's kind of a sad situation. So, I just want to ask mm. that. Thank you. Okay. So, I think there was, there was a gentleman at the front as well. Yeah. Thank a second hand mic. Um, thank you very much. My name is Eze Ugal. I'm from um, Sacred Heart Parish in Holloway. My question was to do with Nigeria, and you touched on Nigeria. Um, the attacks on Christians in Nigeria is so multifaceted. It, it just, in every kind of way, I think internally we've got um, more than a million internally displaced people. You uh, mentioned the attack on the cathedral on a particularly significant day um, mm -hmm. for Christians. And I just wonder, especially Nigeria as a country that was part of the empire that has significant links with the UK, I've had rare opportunities to talk with people who had uh, contact with the UK government, but there just seems to be such um, a reluctance. I, I don't quite understand how and from where that comes from. Last year, we had four priests murdered in Nigeria. Mm. We've already had one priest murdered in Nigeria this year. Mm -hmm. um, you have, uh, whether it's in the north or in the south, and in particular, the, you, everyone's aware of Boko Haram. What they may not be so aware of mm -hmm. is that we have the so-called Fulani herdsmen. Mm -hmm. And when you mention it to the government, they say, oh, it's traditional farmer herder um, conflict. Mm -hmm. There are not many farmers in the UK who travel around with rocket-propelled grenade launchers, mm. seriously, mm. Uh, or AK-47s. It's just strictly not necessary for cows. And then we have the other thing that um, you've got um, uh, people from Chad being allowed into the country just to settle wherever they like, just basically take over someone. My question is just, what is the source of the reticence where we have influence, it's not everywhere we have influence, it's not so easy to twist Putin's hand, but where we have influence, what's the source of the reticence mm -hmm. to just help ordinary people who are just trying to get along with their lives? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, India. Um, I mean, the, one of the problems about India is, uh, is denial. 
So um, if I go, uh, I mean, this is not a pro-Pakistani comment, by the way, but <laughs> if I go to the Pakistan High Commission, which I do from time to time, and say, you know, what a terrible thing has happened uh, to Christians or, or some, someone else, uh, they will usually put up their hands and say, yes, yeah, well, thank you, but, you know, we, we really are not a very nice people and, and so on. <laughs> if, you, if you go to the Indian High Commission, there's flat denial. You know, this cannot happen in India. We are the largest democracy in the mm -hmm. world. Um, the courts are open and so on. So yes, but a, a nun was raped and paraded naked in the street. I mean, you know, so there is denial. I think that's the, one of the first obstacles. Um, the, the R20, the, you know, the G20 that's just been held in Indonesia, there was a, par for the first time, there was a parallel conference called the R20 uh, sponsored by the government of Indonesia, to give it credit, uh, which uh, was able to discuss quite openly, including about Nigeria, uh, about, the, about freedom uh, of belief and uh, freedom of religion. Uh, the, next R20, the next G20, and therefore the next R20, is in India. And I'm hoping uh, and working for it that this will form a major question there when the leaders of other nations are, are, are uh, guests in India. There is some beginning of a dialogue with, um, I don't know what to call them, sort of nationalists who are becoming more moderate about the place of non-Hindus in, in India. It's too early to say what the result of that might be. The general election is next year. We don't know what the result might be. Uh, but there are a lot of very dissatisfied people in India, and not just from the minorities. So um, yeah, I think we need to pray for that. Um, the Catholic Church is a very large church in India. I mean, uh, 25 to 30 million people, and I was <laughs> Astonished, you know, the Catholic Bishops' Conference in Pakistan has eight bishops in it. In India, it has 176. So that's the side, and there are three rites, you know, the Western rite, but also the two Eastern rites. And they have clout, they have institutions, uh, they can make a difference, and they're learning to because they're not used to this uh, kind of persecution that has now come upon them. I mean, on Nigeria, um, a very positive development, which I think needs to be strengthened, is the Christian Association of Nigeria, where all kinds of Christians, including the Catholic Church, have got together uh, to combat uh, what is happening, uh, of course, peacefully. Uh, but it's uh, when all of these people are put together, it makes for a, you know, government has to notice, uh, if for nothing else, the, vo the votes that it represents. But um, well, how to put it, uh, a, a British doctor working in Joss uh, was there and she uh, I asked her, what, you know, what do you think is happening? And she said it's the resumption of the jihad from the north to the south that was interrupted by the British presence. That is what's happening. And this is a secular person. Uh, I think that is what is the case. There are other factors involved. I mean, the herdsmen and the farmers quarrels are, are part of it, uh, but as you say, uh, herdsmen don't go around killing priests and attacking congregations. I mean, you know, this is something that is informed by an increasing kind of Islamism. And um, this, is, this also happens in Pakistan, for instance, where uh, Islamist rhetoric is not always in itself violent. Sometimes it can be pledged to nonviolence, but it can lead some people to violence. And this is something that governments need to give attention to, including the Nigerian government. The British have a presence, a military presence in Nigeria uh, to advise the Nigerian army, and we should hold them to account. Uh, why is the army of the largest country in Africa so woefully inadequate in defending its own citizens from extremist violence. And what are these British advisors doing in equipping this army to deal with this situation? Thank you, Monsignor Michael. I'm just conscious that um, 
we've been told strictly by Neve to, to wrap up by five past the hour, and so I think we've got time for perhaps two more questions, which we'll try and answer pithily. So, um, uh, the, the, sorry, this is very arbitrary. Just uh, the, the gentleman here in the front, and, and the woman, yes, you, <laughs> if that's right. I think if it's a gentleman, it must be a lady, wasn't it? Yes, <laughs> the lady, so I beg your pardon, <laughs> quite right. Uh, my name's James. Um, I just want to make a point, really, uh, and, and it leads to a question. I work in multi-faith ministry, and we spend a lot of our times during our lunch break, all of, all of us, all the chaplains from different faiths, discussing the persecution that is common to all our faiths. Mm. Um, and I understand why today we're concentrating on Christianity, but what's transpired from these conversations is we don't work together to um, eradicate all religious persecution. So my question is, is there a body of all faiths together that come together to actually advocate this uh, discrimination against religious persecution? And also, how then will we transpond it locally so that in our own districts, our own parishes, or together with multi-faith, to actually have this one common goal of eradicating religious persecution that affects by the sound of our conversations in my place of work, all of us. Okay, that's, and then, Errol, oh, yes, there, thank you. Um, I'm really worried about my children in schools at the moment. So obviously living in the UK, we're luckily at the moment not experiencing the type of tragedies and terrors that are going on in other parts of the world um, and all of which are extremely worrying. Um, but as a mother of three at the moment in um, comprehensive and um, actually not Catholic education, I, would, I wanted to ask if there was any advice that you could give to a parent who wants to um, have good conversations with leaders of schools. So I am actually going to have a second conversation with a head teacher and a deputy head and a head of year seven um, in my local grammar school to try to protect my child from um, learning things at inappropriate moments for their developmental stage, um, things that they're being exposed to that I don't agree that they should be exposed to. <laughs> um, and yeah, essentially just asking for any advice that you might give to sort of take that battle on um, that's it, really. Just how can you help me, or is there, you know, something that we can all do together to to have a voice and not be silenced? Because at the moment, I feel like we're all being silenced um, in in schools and in lots of um, yeah, lots of organisations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Father, for your question. Um, I'm, I don't believe in sort of kissy-kissy dialogue, whether that's interfaith or ecumenical. Uh, you know, I mean, it, we, we wasted a lot of, I mean, I wasted a lot of my time on that. So I, you know, I think dialogue has to be focused. And one of the important questions about dialogue is fundamental freedoms. It's not just about persecution, but it's about the freedom of people to, to, to think uh, freely, to, to speak freely, um, uh, to write freely, and so on. So uh, for many years, I led the dialogue with Al-Azhar al-Sharif, the Muslim place of uh, Sunni learning, uh, located in Cairo, but people from all over the world there. And our discipline was always, uh, each side had one question every year that they could put. Um, often the questions were about these fundamental freedoms uh, for worship, for instance, expression, and so on. And after some years, the then Sheikh of Al-Azhar, Sheikh Tantawi, who's uh, now passed away, he and I did a joint lecture uh, with Cardinal Michael Fitzgerald in the chair, who was then the papal nuncio there. Uh, on this, well, what I said was not important, but Sheikh Tantawi said in Cairo, in Cairo, not in London, or New York, he said, what people in Egypt believe is no business of the state. Now that is a revolutionary thing to have said, and I think it arose to some extent because of our dialogue. Um, 
similarly with the holy city of Qom, with the, with the Shia ulama, there is uh, quite a lot of thinking going on among the Shia ulama about the role of religious leaders in the state. It's not all that it seems uh, on the media. Uh, so the, um, I would say discuss these questions in a focused way with the sorts of case studies uh, and of course always uh, to be prepared to support uh, Muslims, for instance, where they are being persecuted, like the Rohingya. Um, I have worked with the Burma Muslim Network uh, because I recognize what is happening to them has happened to Christians also in Burma. Uh, and uh, the, the press gives so much attention to the Uyghur people uh, in China, rightly. Uh, but of course, what is happening to the Uyghur to these days is what has been happening to Christians over so many years, so we can express our solidarity. But what I would say with interfaith dialogue is be focused at whatever level it is, whether it is uh, regional or international. Uh, it is possible to address uh, difficult questions uh, together and to find, this is why I put up all those things about traditions of tolerance that there are. Uh, in different cultures and religions, and uh, if people are so minded, they can appeal to them. And the question is, why don't they? You know, why, why don't they appeal to them more than they should? I think we should appeal to them. Um, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, the lady, I haven't just, asked. Just have go very quickly. Have I answered can. the lady? No, no, I, I don't haven't. think you have. Yeah, but no, just no, I think that's very important. I, I know Ryan will say something about this, but. Uh, there is a website called Parent Power. Uh, I think, uh, do look it up. It equips parents how to deal with schools that are trying to do things that are beyond the curriculum and beyond the guidance from the Department of Education. Uh, there is a very good guide uh, from a body called the Christian Institute about what teachers uh, have to say and what they don't have to say, uh, and also uh, what they can say about their own beliefs. So it's not all that it seems. Uh, the Christian Coalition for Education, which is a very widely cast coalition, including Catholics, uh, also has uh, helpful material. Uh, I chair the Christian Coalition for Education, and there is an annual conference where you can go and you will find, um, it, uh, uh, you will find resources uh, to deal with those sorts of questions. Well, thank you very much, Monsignor Michael. I'm afraid that's about all we have time for. It remains for me very briefly before I hand over to Ryan, Christopher, and ADF to thank you all for coming. Mm. And above all, we need to remember that, especially with regard to persecuted Christians, wherever they may be, it's by standing together, it's by working together, it's by praying together that we can break down the barriers, we can break the silence. So I do commend you to come over to our store, sign our petition for Nigeria, and um, but above all, to thank Monsignor Michael for his expertise and for his commitment to this wonderful cause. So thank you all very much indeed.